board meeting to order. Will you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you. Mrs. Mayor, if you would do the roll call, please. Absolutely. Alex Aker. Here. Lisa Collins. Um, I have not heard from her, so. All right. Oh. Gary Dunlap. Here. Tom Cruise. Here. Cheryl Hancock. Here. Anita Jacosinski. Here. Kate Mayor, I'm here. Tim Medicare. Here. Okay, with six of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Moving on, notice um, board, I'm sorry, board norms reflection. Any comments? I think we've done a pretty good job of uh, adhering to the board norms. We always have some room for improvement, and so we'll continue to work on those. Um, but I, hearing no other comments, then I will move on to approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda was posted, distributed, and sent to the local media. With this in mind, are there any changes to the agenda at this time? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. Okay, all those in favor of approving the agenda as published, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time period per person be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. <coughs> I don't see anyone coming forward. Oh, I do now. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. And yes, I'm just as nervous, so I'll probably break on you. <laughs> My name is Christy Schrader, 311 Mallard Drive. And I'm here on the issues of the classroom sizes. I guess um, the last three times I've come up and I talked about the different issues that we're, we're um, facing in a classroom with behavioral and special needs and physical space. Um, tonight I'm going to tell you about my daughter. Her name is Annika Schrader. She is in your numerical formula. And we call her Houdini. And I'll tell you why. In a blink of an eye, she's gone. Physically, mentally, emotionally. She's moved on to something else. Is she a good student? Absolutely. Is she where she's supposed to be educationally? Absolutely. Is she bad enough to be medicated? No. Is she bad enough to have title help? No. But in a classroom of 30 children, where does that put her? Lost. With a blink of an eye, she will be gone if there's not something to keep her focused. With 30 kids in a classroom, you're gonna have one teacher to try and figure out 30 kids, 30 different personalities, 30 different needs. Will they catch my daughter's focus issues quick enough so she doesn't get lost in the classroom? That is a very deep concern of mine. Another thing I wanna just kind of bring to your attention is not last meeting, but the meeting before, we sat here and we watched all of the numbers for the WKCE testing. Everybody did fantastic. 10th grade, we had issues. And we sat here for a good 15, 20 minutes discussing, well, what are we doing about this? Okay, a question I have is a fix to that, would you say let's raise the classrooms? Do you think that would fix the problem? I. I, I would not, that is my personal opinion. I don't think fixing test scores with raising classroom sizes is, is going to make it work, if that makes any sense. I don't want our third grade, I'm sorry, our current second grade, next year's third grade, I don't want that class to be on your projector seven years from now, wondering where did we go wrong, how can we fix this class? 
when they only have two years left. I don't want that. Catch them before it's too late. I do not, and I've said it four meetings in a row, do not want to see these classrooms go to 30 students. And I think it only makes sense. If we're gonna look at the best interest of our kids, it's not the right move. Thank you for your time and I appreciate everything that you do. Thank you very much for coming forward. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. My name is Heather Ladwig. I'm at 2034 Crooked Avenue. I've got some notes, so I stay on track. <laughs> um, this is the first meeting that I've been able to attend with my schedule. Um, this is my, I should introduce my Ava, who is a second grader currently at Evergreen. You know, as I was really reflecting on this proposal, I first went to the board's website, the school district's website, and I, I was really encouraged and pleased to see a lot of different points that came through in that website because I think it shows a common theme that we're all on the same page. Um, you know, things like specific details in the vision and the mission and the core values that point specifically to the need to focus on every single student succeeding and every student preparing them for tomorrow. And I think, you know, that's why we've got such a great representation of second grade parents here because we're all feeling this really strongly that, you know, it's not about the formula, it's about the Ava and the Annika um, and all the other kids, which I'm, I know you understand. Um, but you know, I guess it's talking and relating it to my family, you know, Ava's a great student. She loves school, just like I loved school. Um, you know, I think having the smaller class sizes as we had growing up um, really instilled in me a passion for lifelong learning and I want that for my Ava. Um, I, my greatest concern um, from a personal perspective <coughs> is, like I said, I have a strong student. She's always on green or above in the behavior chart. Um, and so my concern is what about not only the kids that require extra guidance and encouragement and um, education, but what about those who are strong students? Are they gonna be getting enough challenge and enough support? And the last thing I want out of this um, is for my student who loves school right now to get lost in the shuffle um, because the teacher has to spend so much time elsewhere. And so I really fear for that because the last thing I want is for my student, my child, to now start lashing out as a way to get that attention. And I think that's a real concern as well. I don't know if that's been brought up before. And so, um, you know, certainly this is a cost issue on some level as well, I get it. Um, but, you know, if we're looking at 58 students, you know, is it worth $1,000, $1,500 a student, if you put it in perspective, to invest now so that we have 58 strong students 10, 15, 20 years from now building the community um, and serving the community, volunteering in the community um, versus getting lost in the shuffle along the way. So just a couple additional um, perspective points that I appreciate the opportunity to share tonight. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Ava. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? Good evening. Hi, my name is Katie Strasser, 202 Morris Street. Um, I'm here as uh, actually two topics. The first one is a parent of an evergreen student or in my opinion, just a Holman native. Um, I just want to say I'm very thankful that the board is looking at what is best for the students um, at any grade level and really looking into what is necessary in the long run for the growth, the growth of our students, which is, at the end of the day, what is necessary and what needs to happen. 
Um, my second point of conversation where I have the notes is um, about the changes in the health care as a employee spouse of the district and I handle all of that information for our family as many of us do. Um, I'm concerned with the changes we're looking at and making um, to the health insurance. Um, last year we went, in the middle of the calendar year, we added a major change to the deductibles. Um, the school district did um, add an HSA for families to help compensate for the changes, um, and that was a $500 change. And yet at the end of the day, most families were not able to use that $500 if they didn't go to the doctor very often because that was not applicable to deductible. It was not actually even applicable to co-payments. It was only applicable to the 10% co-insurance at the end. And so only a family that was coming close to reaching their maximum benefit was able to use that $500. Um, again, that $500 is on the plate going into the next year. And at the same time, the board budgeted going forward for the proposal for next year. Um, the board had budgeted about a 20 plus percent increase for the changes, and yet the increase in premium only went up 12 percent. At the same time, we're looking at a very large change in the potential costs out of pocket for the employees, um, up to 31 percent if you keep the ch same identical plan that we have. At the end of the day, you may be eligible to a now with $1,000 or 500 if you're a single plan. Um, if you're willing to or did take the health survey. Um, my concern with that is some people may not be able to reach that. And just as Mr. Clark pointed out last week, they may be eligible if they could show that they're trying to meet, meet that 71 points. Um, but in order to do that, they have to go see their medical doctor. And in order to have a full physical exam, that may cost them $250 to $300 of that $500 that they're trying to save in order to just even get that $500. The other concern is I have in writing um, from our administration building um, in December that my husband was very hesitant to take the health insurance or the health survey and have a physical because he was very concerned that that number would be turned into something that could be used in his eyes against him. Um, and our concern with that is I have in writing from December from our administration building that there was no use, no plan in the future at any time that they could foreseeably see of using those numbers for our premiums. And at the end of the day, six months later, they're being used. And so my concern is, yes, I understand that we are moving forward and health care in general is moving forward to try to keep the dollars decreased. And that is very important. But at the same time, when the school district budgeted for 20 plus percent increase and our premiums could potentially be going up 31 percent, that's a concern of mine. And I know it's being looked at. Um, I may be the only one who speaks on it, but I can dig into the numbers and really look. And it's concerning that six months ago or five months ago in December, we had no, no foreseeable use of these numbers to change our premiums, and yet six months later they are certainly being used. So I just want the board to consider it, looking at all possible options. Obviously we all want to keep healthcare costs down. I completely agree about that. I just want to make sure that we're doing the right thing for every employee, every employee's spouse, every employee's family that takes a health insurance, that we look at all those options. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? Anyone else who would like to address the board? Oh. <coughs> I was waiting for everyone else to get up. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Kelly Grabowinski from 1601 Coronado Street in Holman. Um, I too am here part of the Evergreen support system um, for our third grade class as you're all surprised, I'm sure. But um, I'm gonna kind of come at this from a different angle. I have spoke before and it was about my student and how I felt it was going to affect my child. Um, but we recently, we opened and enrolled our kids for 2013, 2014 and they stayed at Evergreen for, for this last year. In March, we moved to the Prairie View footprint 
and we were told in March that because I have a fourth grader going to be in fifth grade and a second grader going to be in third grade, that they could remain at Evergreen because he was going. My oldest was going to be in fifth grade, really going to go through that big change next year. <clears throat> Excuse me, and um, they would keep siblings together. Okay, so I kind of you know approached it as, yep, that was going to happen. Well, with all of the discussion about this third grade class and, and what we were going to do with it, I wasn't feeling like I felt something wasn't right. So I called pupil services last Friday, as a matter of fact. Um, and I was told that my fifth grader could, or my fourth grader to be fifth grader, could remain at Evergreen, but my second grader was going to have to go to Prairie View. As a parent, I went, what are we doing? What are we doing? I mean, why would we split up these kids? Um, you know, and, and I get the whole head count, I get the cost, but I'm going to kind of touch on what Christy said. At what cost are our children's future? What cost? You know, um, so then I said, do I ask my fourth grader, going to be fifth grader, would you change so your brother can have that role model with him? My, my third grader is very um, timid, very mild, um, and he needs some support. Very emotional child. So I know that him going to a new school district without his older brother is going to be very detrimental to him. Um, and so I thought, well, maybe I'll ask my older child to perhaps go to Prairie View with him so he would have that ability to have that older brother with him. Why should I be put in that position to have to ask my fourth grader right now if he would do this? I don't think it's right. I don't think it's fair. Um, I know life isn't fair, but it, I just don't think it's right. And then on top of that, I'm, he, I call this teacher too because I'm very concerned he's going to step back if we make him go to Prairie View alone, um, progress-wise, academically, and she said this would be the absolute worst thing for him. Um, he was put on a prep IEP for the 2014 year, or 2014-2015 year, I'm sorry. Um, and so now he's gonna go into a new school, no longer have Title I support, no longer have his friends or his brother, but yet we expect him to succeed. I don't think it's fair. So I'll leave you with that. May I just ask a yeah. clarifying question? Absolutely. You began by saying you open enrolled, out, so you lived outside of the school district? Yep, yeah, we lived in Trumpelo. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you mm -hmm. for coming forward. I do have one other thing, I'm sorry. Sure. Sorry, I totally That's forgot it. this. The other thing I wanted to bring up is that I know that there's new additions, new subdivisions coming into Holman approved. <clears throat> My question to you is, where are you gonna go with those kids if you have a third grader in the Evergreen District? What are you gonna do with those kids? Are you gonna make a third grade class, a third third grade class then? Or are you gonna let it go to 31, 32? At what point do we say enough's enough? So thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board at this evening, at this time? <laughs> oh boy, I'm super nervous. Oh, okay. Please don't. <laughs> My name is Angie Peterson and I live at 911 Silver Drive. And I have a second grader, Wyatt Peterson and he happens to be in a wheelchair. So um, I know it's been brought up before about the physical, about the special needs and things like that. Um, Wyatt is cognitively pretty bright, um, so his um, needs are more medical and physical than cognitive. Um, but I do, I am concerned because he has showed some memory and comprehension issues, and I feel that um, with more students and uh, the teacher, I, I, just, I just don't know how, why it will get help for that. Um, I'm also very concerned about um, why it wants to be like everyone else. That's, that's what he strives for. He just wants to be a typical kid. And um, I don't know if having 30 kids in a classroom with the desks and things like that and have, have to do modifications and adaption 
for him, which is great, but he just, he just wants to be like everyone else. And so for him to stick out like that is very hard for him. Um, Wyatt has all sorts of um, surgeries and procedures and things like that. And he loves school. <laughs> I just don't want him to hate school because that's what he has. And that's what he really looks forward to. And he just wants to be typical. And so I don't want him to get frustrated and mad and hate school. Because he, he'll always have a battle with physical things. And so if I can, we can get his mind to be, to be so powerful, he could do great things. And I, and I want him to. Thank you very much, and we want that for him, too. So thank you for coming. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? OK, then I'll just wrap it up, I guess, as I've stated before. it's um, We don't have an action item this evening on our agenda. Um, there will be, under Dr. Carlson's report, a brief summary or an update. Um, on where we go from here. Um, as is our practice, we can't respond or don't respond to individual questions or comments that come before us at public participation and fairness of the agenda and the, the um, legal aspect of those sorts of things. But I know that there are a number of things that were mentioned this evening that will be addressed either one-on-one -on -one with individuals that raise them um, or maybe under board comments later board members have that opportunity to make comments so um, but I do appreciate I know the full board appreciates your willingness to come forward and share with us your personal stories moving on then to recognition and thank you Dr. Carlson we have one thank you recognition tonight a donation that has recently been made by the from the Holman rec and Holman Parks and Rec Department for recently donated a thousand dollars to the Holman High School Boys Soccer Program. These funds will be used for purchasing general supplies. So thank you very much to the village and the Holman Park and Rec Department. <coughs> that is it. Okay, thank you. Then moving on to district administrators report. In addition to the written report, I just have a couple items that I want to uh, that are listed on the agenda, and just to make some comments. First of all, an update on the teacher compensation uh, model uh, committee work that's going on. The teacher compensation model committee has met five times, most recently on May 13th. And again, the purpose of this committee is to research and develop a compensation model that best serves our school district community and teachers. And this committee, again, will assist me in making a recommendation possibly in the future to the Board of Education. At the April and May committee meetings, the focus has been on determining a plan to collect additional school district and community input. And the result of the April discussion was to develop a request for proposal document to forward to potential vendors, third parties to learn about the level of services that they would be able to provide the school district and seeking input into teacher compensation. So at the May 13th meeting, the committee reviewed a draft RFP and provided recommended revisions, and that RFP was actually sent out last week. So we are in the process of, of hearing from those and getting um, interest um, back, from, <coughs> back from those parties. So in addition to focusing on the stakeholder input process, committee members continue to research the topic of compensation, including reviewing alternative models already being implemented, not only in our state, but beyond, to get, uh, again, ideas, uh, information that aligns with things that have already been identified to be important. Um, we've, we've said this before, one source of information, you can go to our CESA4 website, and there is a place dedicated to alternative compensation. So I know I had forwarded to the board earlier um, um, a copy of the RFP that was sent out. And um, as part of the RFP, you will see a tentative timeline 
that include, includes board approval um, when we get down to that point. And as early as the June 23rd board meeting, we'll see what interests we have and, uh, and go from there. So I do want to thank the committee for its work. We have a long way to go, but making good progress. Questions on that update? Also, I just wanted to um, update the board on work that's being done regarding all the, the um, elementary staffing work. And just to uh, review a couple things, at the May 12th school board meeting, board member comments conveyed the message to administration that the board is interested in knowing if there are similar or even greater student needs at other grade levels in the district projected to high, have high class averages for next year. In addition, board member comments expressed strong interest in making an exception to the current school board administrative rule and provide additional support to grade three at Evergreen for next year by adding either a, a classroom section and or increasing the level of specialized support. So administration continues to work on a plan to respond to board member comments and direction pertaining to the projected high class averages for several grade levels across the district, beginning with the grade three at Evergreen for next year. And um, again, a, a little bit to reemphasize, since the May 12th board meeting, I would have to say much attention has been given to examining the exceptional student needs at various grade levels across the district. And so attention is being given to potential solutions to address the evergreen grade three level, as well as other potential areas the board may identify to consider making an exception to the board's administrative rule. Um, administration is also examining the potential impact that making an exception may have on future requests and how application of the current class size administrative rule can be consistently <coughs> applied by administration if exceptions are made to the rule by the board. So administration will continue to place this issue as a priority and be prepared to provide potential solutions or options for the board at the June 9th board meeting. So that's an update on progress. Uh, there, is, there is a great deal of work that continues to be done on this issue. And I think it's, I, I wanna make sure people know that and, uh, and, uh, and we'll continue to move forward. Questions? Are there any questions for Dr. Carlson? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, then moving on to reports and discussion, we'll go to the Holman High School Student Council report. Hi, I'm Lindsay Millian. I'm the president of the Holman High School Student Council. And with me is Becca Risch, who's our vice president, and Carly Lemke, who's also part of our executive council. And today, I, we are just here to give you kind of an update of everything that we did this year. I think we had a really successful year. So to start out the year, um, our, our student council always sets up the district's homecoming event. So we planned out our survivor theme for the year. and set up our parade, the dance, and we also had daily activities that we put on at the high school. And we think that was really great. We generated a lot of enthusiasm for the event and getting back in the school year. So we, some of the activities that we had, we had daily minute to win it games during the lunch periods. And that would lead towards a um, class total. as kind of a competition within the school. And we also had a hidden immunity idol, which had a lot of, we hit a little tiki torch guy <laughs> and, um, in the high school and that was really fun. A lot of people would stay after school even to continue looking for it. Um, next in the fall we also did Backpack Day which is a fundraiser we started last year. This is the second year um, to raise money for Relay for Life which is a uh, fundraiser that's um, also helped out through the American Cancer Society. And that went really well this year. It went a little better than last year. Um, and this year, Student Council also decided to match the amount. So we raised about $250. So we were able to give $500 to Relay for Life. So that um, went very well this year. 
Also this year, um, we participated in our annual Christmas shopping event. We always pick a family to sponsor for the holiday season, and we get to go shopping, which is a blast, because <laughs> who doesn't like to spend money? Um, so we get to give presents to the whole family, and then we wrap them, and we send them to them. Um, and it's a really great opportunity to get involved in the community, to give back a little bit, um, and get in that Christmas spirit. So that's something that we've always done, and we'll continue to do, hopefully, next year. Um, and then moving on towards the spring, we had our blood drive, and a part of that blood drive, we're able to give away two scholarships um, to student council members. One of them was our Lindsay Moline, um, and then Colin Trivet, the past um, board representative. So they're going to great individuals, um, and we're proud that we get to sponsor them. All right, and then a little more about the blood drive that Becca was talking about. Each year, Student Council works with the American Red Cross to sponsor two blood drives, one of which is held in April and the other usually June or July. So we had our April blood drive, which was a huge success, as it always is. We always get great comments from the Red Cross workers on how much participation we have. This year, our goal was 80 pints of blood, and we actually met our goal and had 82 pints of blood. And since one pint can save three lives, we saved a potential 246 lives. So that was a really great event. I know everyone in the district and in the high school just loves participating in. That's always really great for us. And so we'll have our next blood drive this summer as well. All right, so then just in conclusion, we feel like we've had a very successful year. Um, it's always a great to be able to present what we've done. Um, we look forward to being more involved in the community and in our school in the future years. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, how many are on the student council people? It fluctuates. <laughs> it fluctuates. We have, um, I think, six executive committee um, yes. officers, yes. members. And the council can go anywhere from like 20 to 80. <laughs> There's a, the population's a lot larger around homecoming year yeah. or homecoming season just because um, <laughs> everyone wants to decorate the, for the Yeah, and we need everybody's help too. So, no. Also, um, student council used to be uh, like a really big force in the school in the last, uh, in the past, it's kind of dwindled. So, but we feel like throughout our high school careers, it's gotten. A lot bigger and and so we feel like it'll continue to do that um, as we depart because <laughs> we are I'm still here got, yeah, <laughs> yeah Be Becca's our junior so she's gonna be the president next year a good resume builder yeah. 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 other questions well on behalf of the board thank you so much ladies for coming and presenting we always enjoy hearing from students your why we're here <laughs> and it's good to see that you're giving back to the community and to fellow students and uh, we thank you for taking a leadership role in that Absolutely. much much appreciated thank you thank, thank you. you thanks for having us okay then moving on to student parent handbooks um, early childhood and four-year-old kindergarten Looks like Sue Eitland is going to do that. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, basically, the um, early childhood and four-year-old kindergarten handbook is very similar to last year's. Um, the main update I would say would be that we had revisited our vision and mission statement. It had been created seven years ago when the program first began and so we wanted to take a look at it with me being in my first year in the position and just seeing you know there's been some changes that have taken place throughout those years so so there is a new vision and mission in there for our program. Um, everything else is pretty similar to the um, elementary handbook um, with the exception of PBIS. There is um, some information in there pertaining to PBIS and how we implement that at our preschool level. So those are the main changes. Do you have any other questions for me? Any questions? Okay, thank you, Sue. Thank you. Okay, then elementary schools, Patrice Tronsted. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, our elementary handbook has stayed pretty much the same as well. Um, you will note on the cover of that we do have an asterisk, which then uh, is indicative of we can make changes on that document as change is needed. One of the changes made during the school year, we had under the dress code that students would not be wearing caps 
in school or in class. We ended, we added uh, the word hats slash caps to that. Um, we had a student that wanted to challenge us on that because caps and hats, they did not, they were the same thing. So that was added. Um, we will have two additional changes uh, in the future once we know the change in the lunch prices, uh, or if they do change for next year, we would change that at that time. And then we're currently working on a an attendance policy at the elementary level, um, looking at um, something that would be more accurate for the elementary. We do not charge our students with truancy. Uh, instead, uh, what actually happens is that uh, parents are charged with contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Um, and so that attendance area would then be reflective of that language. Did anyone have any questions? Any questions? Thank, Thank you. you very much, Patrice. And then middle school, Ryan Vogler. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, the middle school handbook over the last two years has um, gone through quite a facelift. We have tried to update that um, so that it is much more user friendly for staff, parents, students. Um, we've tried to create more links within the document so that uh, when it references a board policy, it can go out to the full policy. This year we continued with those changes. Um, the basic updates that you'll see this year are just where we have uh, different staff that have come into the building and updating that as well as um, just trying to update a little bit more with what we have with PBIS and what our behavior matrix looks like. Otherwise, the handbook looks very much similar to what it did in the past. Any questions on that handbook? Any questions? Maybe, and Ryan, I don't want to put you on the spot, but for the middle school, you do not now provide paper copies for all parents. You um, ask them to check it out electronically, or do you? provide paper copies we do not provide paper pop copies of the entire handbook we do have the middle school agendas and within that agenda in the first front pages uh, we reference several things that are important when it comes to that document but when people do have questions about that yes we have gone to much like we have with our newsletter mm -hmm. of having that online um, but always letting people know that we would be more than happy to offer them a paper copy of that if they needed it and may I ask Patrice and Sue if that's the same process I see shaking heads for the elementary level. So thank you very much. Absolutely, thank you. And then the high school, Bob Bear. Same for the high school, pretty much status quo. have tried to make um, <coughs> more specific information there in regards to Renaissance recognition, the um, academic recognitions, and then also some more specifics and additional information in regards to PBIS at the high school for the upcoming year. And then pretty much the same in regards to your last question that you asked Ryan in regards to trying not to send out as many paper copies, but will send out as requested. So any questions in regards to some of the changes you may have seen in our handbook for next year? And I think as would be expected, any policy changes that happen throughout the year, those are done at that time um, right. okay. in the handbook, so. Okay, thank you, Bob. Thanks. And just to the group that came and presented, I wanna say thank you. I know that this is an ongoing duty responsibility and it is very detailed. We know that it's those details are important. Even something like a hat versus a cap can be a very important thing to our students and parents and those sorts of things, especially when it comes to policies. So your work on this is much appreciated on behalf of the board. Thank you so very much for all the work to all the building administrators um, that you do on this because it is very, very important tool for our parents. So thank you. Then moving on to employee handbook, language revisions, Melissa Cates. Hello. 
Um, so the two items tonight, I'm not even going to bring them up. They are actually two, one section is going to be brand new, um, the DPI reporting, and then the personnel student relations has some updates, changes to it. And all of these changes are due to the proposed deletion of the employee conduct policy. So it's nothing new to the district or to our employees. It's simply moving it from one policy to the employee handbook so we can hopefully reduce the number of policies we have um, and just incorporate those that language into one document. So any questions? Any questions on that? All right. Okay. Otherwise, we'll be bringing a whole bunch of material that's really um, grammatical deletions, things like that, that we're going to bypass the other two groups and just bring it straight to the board over the next few meetings. So um, you'll be seeing some more material to review. Wonderful, thank Thanks. you. Okay, then moving on to the refuse hauling and bid results. John, Mr. Daly. Um, <clears throat> I'm here to present the, the refuse bid which we got last week. It's a five year bid beginning July 1st, 19, or excuse me, 2014. And you'll, mm -hmm. you should have in front of you a bid summary sheet You'll notice uh, waste management at 4126 per month. That's on all ex inclusive cost, fuel environmental charges included. The second one is, uh, I did the math for you uh, because they gave us a school year bid and a summer bid and then a surcharge for fuel. So it comes at today's rate comes to $5,225.26 a month. Hilltopper at 5115 with a five year lock. And you'll see on uh, an issue paper before you that we'll ask you to act on at your next meeting, um, recommending uh, waste management. Any questions? Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you, John. Then moving on to the consent agenda item, we have eight items this evening under the consent agenda. We've got the board minutes. Personnel report, financial claims and accounts, nutrition services prime vendor bid, uh, health insurance plan quote, computer purchase, information technology, and first reading of two policies. At this time, is there any board member who would like to consider separately any of these items? I would ask for item 11.5. 11.5, which is the health insurance plan quote. Tom, did you have something? Or same with Same one. Any other? Okay, um, then I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items um, as presented with the exception of 11.5. Is there a second? Second. Discussion on any of those? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda items as presented, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes. Then consent agenda item 11.5, health insurance plan quote. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve the uh, plan quote as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Second. And then discussion. Um, my concern with this was the um, <coughs> Affordable Care Act and how it's going to impact, impart, impact this on the budget of the school two or three years from now. And I, I admit that I'm fairly um, naive when it comes to this stu sort of stuff, but there are some, the, the Affordable Care Act does one good thing. It makes sure that people can get insurance. Without question, that is a value for our country and for our, our society in general. But there are hidden costs associated with it, and it is going to increase the health care costs. And I'm concerned with the long term budget and the employees and how we can this uh, addressing the Affordable Care Act with this so, sort of. I don't think this quote addresses it the way I, it should be addressed, in my opinion. Um, is there a question would you like to or would administration like to respond to the comment or well 
if you, only, if you don't have any questions, is there an, an alternative plan we can look at as far as being more proactive and making the teachers more empowered? Maybe, as I've discussed before, having a, um, instead of a benefit <coughs> pack, and having a contributions type package. Is that, a, is that viable or is that not a consideration? Mr. Clark, maybe if you could um, maybe give you a couple of things, if helpful, just to review the process that we have followed for input, but also if there's anything that's specific to the Affordable Care Act. And I know that joining Mr. Clark, we have Mr. Miller and then Janice Walver from the Insurance Center who has been very helpful throughout this process as well. I'm gonna start with the Affordable Care Act and um, while I try to um, stay abreast of those things as a part of my professional responsibilities. I have to admit that um, that's something that's really difficult to keep your arms around. Um, we have reviewed two primary factors within the Affordable Care Act, and that is eligibility, and the second is affordability. The Affordable Care Act intending to say that people should have an opportunity for insurance, but then when you give them the opportunity, it means nothing if it's so expensive compared to the wages they earn. And uh, our review of both affordability uh, and eligibility, um, we're in great shape. And in fact, the proposal that's presented where the district moves to an 85% contribution towards health insurance and offers the <coughs> wellness HRAs will put us in even better position because all of those are considered under the umbrella of the health insurance plan. Um, Janice, I don't know if we have had um, individuals come in and review what the district's doing um, uh, now in terms of the Affordable Care Act as more decisions are made and more... Um, timelines are put in place. Yeah, there's, there's absence of timelines. There's even a lack of clarity on um, um, how to apply the rules. And uh, so as those interpretations come out, we'll continue to um, monitor and see if we have to make changes. We'll, we'll just hope it fails in general. What if what? I just hope it fails, the whole, oh, the whole law no. collapses, because you don't hear updates about it at all anymore. No one knows what it's doing. We don't, we don't know how, it's, how viable it is at all. So I understand the lack of direction you have in getting your arms around it, because you can't get your arms around it. But if it does go through, it's going to be expensive, and it's going to raise the Cadillac plan. This is this is a Cadillac plan. It's going to raise our rates. That's what I'm concerned about as a board member, five, ten, twenty years down the road. Well, we'll need to continue to monitor. And my belief is that while we try to have a three-year direction, we won't have anything like this. 10, 15, 20 years down the road, I think this is a moving target for our society as well as for the school district. So while I'd like to predict I can say we're in good shape relative to the Affordable Care Act currently and anticipating to be in an even better position as it moves forward. We've got to keep monitoring it, though. I, ben or Janice, did I? Oh, that's correct. We, are, we monitor it ongoing uh, because that's what we do, and uh, we get weekly updates on any modifications or uh, additional guidance that is released, and we communicate that very timely to our clients because it's things that might impact their current plan or what they need to use for forecasting future plans. It's a fair concern. And Dr. Carlson, you asked also about the process, and I didn't know if there was something specific you wanted us to address in terms of time. I was just referencing Mr. Cruz, if there's anything as far as staff input. And I know we've presented our process in the past, but and Mr. Cruz or anybody else, if there's any need for a clarification on that, again, I don't want to repeat. Uh, if not necessary, but uh... I will say one thing I think this law has done. I think it's really brought out the lack of transparency in healthcare, and I think it's really brought in the forefront how much healthcare costs, and people value it more, and they're watching it. That's really important. So um, I do think that Mr. Clark, some of his proactiveness and deals with some of the health initiatives they've put in place to try to live healthier and all that kind of stuff are realize it is important but uh, if anything um, people need to know how much these things cost and it's not just given out and free or and I realize people don't think it's free that's that's really a, uh, a misnomer it's very uh, 
it's not an accurate way of describing it, but if you don't have an appreciation where the money comes from or where it's going, my point is we really have to drive those decisions down to the local person so they know what these things are. And I would, I just, my, one of my fears is that if this goes forward with the, with the Affordable Care Act and all this sort of bigger government st stuff and it raises these costs, I just don't want the employees to be, to be and I think Jay's got a, got a hold of it and so does Dale and, and the staff here, but that are, they're blindsided by something of some surprise. We can't do that anymore. And I would hate that to pull the rug out from anyone. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you said it in much greater detail, but I, uh, I agree that uh, consumerism and feeling like you've got a stake in it is an important part of the success of our plan. Thank you. And then Tim. Um, I guess a few comments here, and, and first off, there, there's a lot of things about the proposals that I like. I like the different plans that are set up, the different options, I think as a district really looking at ways to try and continue to make it affordable for the employees you know by having the different level plans I think is very good and I really like that the concern I have with this um, is increasing the district's um, contribution from 80 percent to 85 percent and there's really <coughs> several reasons why first off I think you know we know that that continues to increase over time we all hear insurance rates go up so we also have to keep in mind that 85 percent this year is more for the district next year is that 85 percent continues to be a bigger piece so as that goes up that now means the district is absorbing a bigger piece of the increases going forward um, it's hard to change back once we've gone to that it's always very difficult to to take that and, and say well we did it now we're going to go back always very difficult and i think that's unfair to continually be changing those parameters. I, I think it's counter to what's happening with most people out there in the general public who are seeing the opposite happen as opposed to this direction. But most importantly, the most important reason why I'm against it, and I think we heard it earlier tonight, class size, number of teachers, is this the best use of the school district's dollars? And just doing the math, I think we talked roughly, this is gonna cost the district quarter of a million dollars, I think is the number we were just throwing around ballpark. That's four teachers. We're behind in our technology. We're talking solutions for additional technology. And we're behind in that. And I'm not saying that this isn't important, but is this the best use of those precious resources? And could we be better off investing in more teachers or better technology? Is this the best use of that quarter of a million dollars? And I think no. And that's why I am opposing the plan simply on the basis of, of that because I think those dollars could be better allocated to better help education and our students in the district. Okay. Um, and Mrs. Jagosinski? <clears throat> I guess I just wanted to address a couple of comments that were made. The, um, Tim, you mentioned the 85% would be um, a larger chunk as the cost of health care goes up, but 15% will be a larger chunk for employees also as the cost of health care goes up. No so, um, And I guess the, the thing that kind of sticks in my craw is the term Cadillac plan. We've heard the term Cadillac plan used over the years referring to anything involving government <laughs> funds being used for um, public employees' health care. And I find it really insulting to assume that because somebody who's earned a health care plan as part of their benefit and that health care ban has benefits that they can use and they don't have to sell a kidney to use, it's a Cadillac plan. It's not a Cadillac plan. Even a couple of years ago when they had much better health insurance and a much, much lower deductible and no copay and a better prescription copay. It wasn't a Cadillac plan. Now that, and I've sat on negotiations when, <coughs> when we were discussing this health care cost. Um, I've watched this deductible go up to thousands of dollars. <coughs> and to say that it's a Cadillac plan when you, you don't have a woman sitting next to you in negotiations saying, can I afford food or can I take my kid to the doctor? This is not a Cadillac plan. It's called providing health care for your staff members. Um, that's my only comment. 
Okay, anybody else? Any other comments? I have a couple questions. Just to clarify, um, earlier this evening, one of the, the statements that was made was that the HSA, which is, yes, could only be used for the 10% coinsurance and not deductible. Is that correct? That is correct. But it's an HRA. Uh, um, Janice uh, offered a technical clarification. It's referred to as an HRA plan as the school district has designed it, not as an HSA. An HSA plan requires you to have a specific plan design model with very high deductibles and co-pays. Ours did not meet that criteria. So it's not an HSA, it's an HRA. But on the street, people kind of interchange Twine those terms like they mean the same thing, but our plan would not qualify for an HSA. So we have an HRA, Correct. and that money though can only go towards that co coinsurance. It can't be used for deductible. Correct. Deductibles or copays are exempt. It's the coinsurance. Only coinsurance is the portion of the employee's obligation for health care um, that was covered. Is that something that we? plan, design that plan, or is that something that's dictated to us? We designed that. Would it be an extra expense to say, because I guess I was under the assumption when we increased the deductibles and then gave the HRA, I thought we were doing that in lieu of and recognition of the increased deductibles. I didn't realize it was such a small well, the people who are using it, they're not thinking it's small. And in last year, we kind of had an um, unusual transition. What was the time of the year? And we January 1st of 2013 was when the deductible year initially started, and that was the $100 deductible. And then as of September 1st of 2013, we changed to the $500 deductible, but we gave deductible credit for anyone who had met any portion of their deductible from January 1st through September 1st. And that deductible carried over through till June 30th of this year. So we actually did a very long deductible year. So we try to hold the employees harmless because of the long benefit period. So that was one of the factors. But probably a more primary factor was you've, I think, heard me use the word consumerism. Mm -hmm. Trying to create some skin in the game, some ownership. And uh, so we had a choice. Do you um, give out... Um, um, dollars at the front end for people to go and use the services or do you try to protect people who at the back end have higher costs and really if you're trying to create a consumerism based model which overall drives claims costs down you construct it so it's on co-insurance and that's not how everybody does it and we certainly could have done it the other way this was a choice aligned with our overall multiple year direction to bring premiums down for everybody, both those who are paying 20% and those that are paying 80% so we could all enjoy more money in our pockets. And then the issue of the health survey, um, of course, in order to get that, they had to see a medical doctor, correct? And would that not be part of their annual physical? Is that, I thought, well care, like an annual physical was covered under our plans. So what you're referring to is if the person does not qualify for the wellness health risk assessment money on a score of 71. No, I'm saying in order to get that score, do they have to pay to get that score? No. In fact, we pay them to come in and get that score. So they would have to see a medical doctor? No, they would not. Okay. They come in and see someone we hire, okay. to come in and do health risk assessments, including blood draws. This we did last fall, and we plan on repeating in August. They, the, and in addition, they have to fill out a survey, and then based upon, you know, get the blood pressure taken, their body weight, some circumference measurements that calculate um, percentage body fat, and a number of other things. Those are all done by people that we hire. Um, and then we pay the employee who does that and participates in a coaching call to review their results, we pay them $50 in the form of a debit card. There is no cost for that. I think the question that was asked tonight was not necessarily about the school-sponsored health risk assessment, but it was, what if I don't get a 71? Then they would have to see a doctor. Well, unless they've improved by five points from right. last year, 
then they don't need to see a doctor. But if they qualify on an alternative and under the law, so there's some people with health conditions that just prevent them from five more points or 71, and we still want to recognize their wellness. Um, in those cases, they may need to see their physicians. And Janice, you can tell me, um, there, there, there's going to be some... Care would be covered under Preventive care would be covered under the wellness <laughs> benefit, but I don't know that that means that all costs would be covered. So for that percentage of our population, there may be some out-of-pocket costs to qualify. But remember what we did, part of this, you, you can't separate the parts, is we're introducing a health insurance benefit that pays 85% by, by the district, and it's a premium that I think is equal or lower than last year. Just a little bit lower than last year, so you need not even participate if you don't want to, and still be no, for, well, you'd probably be a little bit ahead. Um, so we're trying not to make people go that direction, but we know that wellness is again the answer for people enjoying life as well as keeping these costs down so we can do other good things with the money as Mr. Mettinger is referring to. And so employees can do the same. Thank you. Another clarification uh, comment was made that uh, we had budgeted 20% for our health, health insurance renewal. In fact, we had budgeted 10%. I just wanted to clarify that also. And the recommendation, as you saw in the issue paper, includes the full 10%. To make all these provisions of the recommendation happen, it uses the full 10%. Yes, we had predicted or had been told possibly 20% increase. Yeah, or more. So, or more. Based even upon our had... claims ratio, that's, uh, that's, and what was happening in the market, yes. Okay, any other questions, mm -hmm. comments on this? I got a question. Sure. Why did we increase the coverage for the employees? What was the reason for doing that? Mr. Medigan had pointed that out. Why? Why did we do that? I think it's a nice thing to do. I'm not saying anything. I'm against it, but I'm just curious why. Mr. Clark? Or I, I, or I would never preempt Dr. We're both Dr. going Carlson. to talk about the affordability, one of the things, but go ahead, Jay. Yeah, that is one of the issues. <laughs> the school board has heard for a number of years, and I think uh, this is Jay Gazinski was referring to exactly one of those cases where um, we have an eclectic group of employees. Um, we have people who work very few hours a day only during the school year. Um, we have people who through the degrees they have and the scope of responsibilities they have in the classroom earn more for those days of work. And we have employees that work year round. And um, the take-home income each of them has is different, yet the cost of health insurance is pretty much the same. And so what we created was a group of, as rates continued to jump over time, a group of people who could not afford. And so this was uh, in one way to create affordability for employees. Um, we tested that by looking at uh, benchmark school districts in the area and what we were competing with. Uh, in terms of insurance rates in other um, Mississippi Valley Conference schools and geographic proximity school districts. And um, at 80% contribution, um, we were one of the lowest contributing districts to our uh, employees' health insurance premium. So part of it is to remain an attractive employer as well. I'm just those, those are the reasons. I understand that there's philosophical differences on those things, but... Uh, well, I, we're a service industry, so I understand the concept of, of maintaining, uh, turning over employees is hard on any business. And I'm not saying school's a business, but that's how I look at things. Um, I'm curious, the lady, uh, the insurance center lady, what happened with the, ins with the school district you said that actually did put all of the employees into... Yeah. Didn't you make a comment about that? Because I, I mentioned about putting them all in the exchanges. You said there was some school that did that. And they brought it up. It was Eau Claire was discussing it. Oh, they didn't do it, though. Oh, I thought you said they did. I've not heard a follow-up on that. I know that. Okay. Uh, I was just, just curious about. what their, what their um, reasons were. But if they didn't do it, then I guess I know it's, not, it's, a, it's a moot point. And just keep in mind, this is a one-year renewal or one-year plan that we're looking at that we would be voting on this evening. So as issues like Affordable Care Act come up, um, 
continued increasing premiums, those sorts of things. We will be discussing this at next year at the same time. So some of those things, um, <coughs> Tom, just for your maybe uh, background, the idea of a dual enrollment, dual choice, has been something that I know we have been talking about for many years, making that an option. And so the fact that we're moving to that, this well, giving that option, and, and it really does kind of allow for our employees to you know, be consumers, um, not consumers. only of the insurance, but um, of, the, of their health care. It is a step forward. And so we see what works best um, oftentimes for our employees is to take those small steps instead of all of a sudden making I, I big changes. I so. that's, that's realistic. So any other comments or questions? Um, just thank you to um, all of you that are sitting up there because I know you look out for us economically, but also thank you and the rest of us who look out for our staff who for many years have taken home much less money than they took home the year before. And when you bring up a point to us that says, you know, compared to other districts, we were the lowest. Thank you for bringing that up and still trying to keep us fiscally sound. Even with this plan, we have staff members that will have more economic impact in their lives. And I know you know that. Um, so with all the talk that's gone on tonight, I, I want to say that I'm proud of what you brought forward to us. I appreciate that even with this plan, our staff members will have some major adjustments to make. And yet they also have the wellness emphasis, which I like. I just appreciate all those things. We're all going through changes. People in business are. I want it to be said that we are not doing anything that we shouldn't be doing for our staff. And um, again, just thank you for what you brought forward. Hey. Anyone else? Well then, a motion has been made and seconded to approve the health insurance plan as presented. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. 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 Motion carries. So then, board member report and discussion. I'll call on board members in order of the roll call. I'd ask for you to present any comments or committee reports that you have. And we'll start with Alex. <laughs> Sorry. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I can't build off anybody else. Um, no comments. No comments? OK. Thank you, though. OK, then, uh, Mr. Dunlap. Uh, I would just like to thank everyone who presented tonight. and. Um, and thank everyone for bringing their opinions to the school board. It's always nice to hear everybody have, have something to say. And also like to congratulate the class of 2014. Uh, what a great group of young adults we have in that class. And I wish them nothing but success and, and let them know that they've raised the bar considerably for <laughs> the home going forward. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cruz. Uh, I have to mimic what Gary says it was a really neat seeing all the students um, and throw their hats in the air at the end. That was pretty cool. And these chairs are every bit worth this board position. These are really nice chairs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Mrs. Jagosinski. Um, I would just like to thank everyone who came and spoke tonight and um, thanks to the faces who are in the audience every week because um, it's just nice to see you there. Nice to look out and see something besides the reporters and the principals who we always love seeing. Yeah. Um, so thank you. I'm glad you're out there. Not that we don't there. like you guys. <laughs> I didn't say that. You did. And, and uh, congratulations to all the graduates. It was a very nice ceremony. So um, that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Mayor. Just ditto with um, Gary and Anita. Graduation is always a very moving time. And I'm always proud to be a part of that and represent those kids and their parents. Um, and yeah, what they said about all of you that are out there tonight and those of you who spoke, we know that takes some courage sometimes. Appreciate that. Keep it coming. Thank you. Um, Mr. Menninger. Uh, just a, a couple of quick comments and just echo again, I think it is always wonderful when we have public participation and people uh, attending the meetings. So again, thank you. Um, those input and, and opinions are very valuable. Um, 
again, <coughs> congratulations to the class of 2014. Um, you know, we've still got a couple of weeks yet or a week and a half of the rest of the school, and this is where it gets hard because the weather gets to bear the kids want to be outside. Um, so certainly encourage all of them that I know are sitting home watching the board meeting tonight mm -hmm. um, to continue to stay focused. And I was debating whether to start tonight or not, and I thought I would because graduation has now started. And <laughs> Cheryl's smiling because she knows I, I will start this and continue this at every board meeting now. But I just want to remind everyone that we only have four more board meetings between now and the start of fall sports. So just keep that in mind. Hard to believe. Really? <laughs> um, also, earlier tonight, we had our Buildings and Grounds Committee meeting.